Okay, thanks everyone. It's like we're continuing a theme for this session this morning. We talked Turla, we've talked Romcom, uh, now we're going to talk Sandworm and not Sandworm at the same time for reasons that we will see. So uh, we'll discuss in this final session for this morning's uh, series, reviewing the 2022 KASAT incident and look into its implications for distributed communication environments. Uh, obviously, this is just a summary of a much longer work, so I do encourage you, if this is remotely interesting, to check out the paper published on the Virus Bulletin website, as that will have significantly greater detail on a number of these items. So who am I? My name is Joe Slowick. Currently, I do a number of things for the MITRE Corporation. Uh, I manage aspects of the CTI and ICS frameworks for attack, as well as doing critical infrastructure threat research. Previously, I've done a lot of other things, um, bounced around a little bit, but neither here nor there right now. More importantly, what is our agenda? So first, we're going to talk about the KASAT incident at the very start of the current phase of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We'll look into different phases and types of operations associated with this intrusion, pivot into lessons learned, and then finally consider some implications and paths forward based upon a more thorough review of this incident since more details have emerged since its initial disclosure a couple of years ago. So first, the 2022 KASAT incident. We talked about this already, right? There have been publications on this. Uh, it's two years old at this point in time. So what more can we really say about this event? Well, given the nature in which information sort of dribbled out over time and more details emerged, quite a bit actually, because the common perception that remains across most of industry is that this was an incident of wiper malware that was distributed in a supply chain attack knocking out satellite communications. Okay. That's not wrong, but it's also not the complete view on what happened during this event, because there is more going on here, which we'll get into, that there were several aspects of this intrusion that uh, did not get, well, for the re many reasons, that chief of which being lack of evidence and lack of information to third parties and to those that were investigating, uh, just weren't clear at the time. And it really wasn't until later uh, revelations and disclosures that certain aspects became revealed, because the reality is that the 2022 KASAT incident actually consists of two overlapping events. The timing of these events ramps, uh, aligns quite closely with the initial ramp up to and then uh, the start of the current phase of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the spring of, or late winter of 2022. Uh, seeing this really rise up with some other cyber operations and then almost commencing within hours of uh, Vladimir Putin's announcement of a special military operation and then continuing uh, in alignment with the actual invasion phase. The information about this event was revealed over time following the event, resulting in this unclear picture, that it really wasn't until uh, last year, 2023, during the DEF CON and Black Hat conferences in Las Vegas in the US, that certain elements of this uh, event were disclosed in a bit further detail, but not really written up either, which is unfortunate because it really uh, led to misunderstanding around what turns out to be quite a complex series of interlapping events or interlocking events uh, that resulted in KASAT communication disruption. So in looking at this as multiple events, we certainly have the wiper malware incident uh, referred to as acid rain. I see Juan is in the audience. <laughs> um, so Juan Andreas Guerrero Assad, his team at Sentinel One did great work in identifying and analyzing the malware sample responsible for this element uh, that resulted in outages requiring the manual restoration of systems. And as we'll see shortly, also resulted in some bleed over into other areas that highlights some of the implications behind this event for other aspects of critical infrastructure functionality. But there was also concurrently rolling distributed denial of service activity. Now, at first, like DDoS, who cares? Like DDoS is unsexy, unsophisticated, and quite frankly, kind of boring, right? Yes and no, because while there was some of our typical volumetric DDoS activity that was targeting elements of the KASAT framework, there was also some very interesting manipulations of DHCP traffic that allowed for very targeted attacks on specific nodes within the KASAT uh, management infrastructure that allowed for the removal of communication nodes in a fairly interesting, uh, as well as again, a targeted fashion. This proceeded both before and continued after the wiper event and indicated shifts in the adversary's methodology in response to defender mitigations over time, which was quite interesting. Uh, in talking with the Viasat, the ownership of the KESAT network, uh, they found this to be really interesting to respond against uh, because it definitely indicated that the adversaries were co-evolving with defensive 
mitigations in near real time as the event played out for a couple of weeks following the initial phases of the event and the invasion of Ukraine. So this is very much an eye chart right now. Uh, this is why you should look at the paper, because this will be more clear in the paper. But the central point of this is that we had the start of various DDoS activity beginning on the 23rd of February that uh, started to transition as we get closer into the evening towards the core management network uh, in Turin, Italy, accessed uh, via VPN by the adversary shortly before we see on the 24th of February that uh, the actual payloads start to execute within the victim environment. This you know, leads to the staging of the malware prior to its execution to start disabling communication nodes. And then as we see at 0250 UTC on uh, the 24th of February, Vladimir Putin announces the special military operation, which then within 10 minutes uh, shows the initial signs of DDoS activity against the Skylogic KASAT network. Finally, uh, in a couple minutes later, we start seeing the first signs of long distance strikes and artillery from Russia targeting Kiev and Kharkiv. And then finally, uh, at around four UTC on the same day, we start seeing the loss of view event taking place across various elements of the KASET network triggered with the acid rain deployment, including what we'll talk about soon, a impact on a German wind power or wind turbine manufacturer, Enercon. Um, so again, this timeline goes into you know, greater detail in the paper, but a uh, quick review that we see a very close sequencing between the start of hostilities or the resumption of expanded hostilities in Ukraine and the timing around the KESAT targeting both from the DDoS and from the malware deployment perspectives. So very interesting coordination between potentially three different entities, traditional Russian military, the acid rain deployment, and the unlinked, uh, we'll get back to this, DDoS activity. So in looking at this, the activity begins shortly before the opening of hostilities and then, roughly, and then is roughly timed with the declaration of the special military operation. So really interesting coordination in terms of traditional and cyber fires when it comes to the KASAT event. Uh, this overlaps with other DDoS and wiper activity that was taking place against Ukrainian entities concurrently, against government and uh, military targets. But this is the only one, that, at least that we know of right now, that explicitly targeted communication networks associated with uh, Ukrainian military command and control. The impacts to this is that you, the Ukrainians themselves, in response to interviews with Reuters and others, uh, indicated significant communication impacts. We don't know precisely what they were. Uh, they're not telling us, and I don't blame them not to. Uh, but more importantly still, we see this timed with the start of the full-scale invasion. But it's also worth noting that there were sporadic effects outside of Ukraine as well, with most notable being the loss of connection by Enerkin wind turbines in Central Europe. Not quite clear where in Central Europe, it was just Germany or elsewhere uh, as well, but 6,000 turbines re representing something like 10 gigawatts worth of generation capacity, loss of connectivity, loss of view condition. Uh, certainly turbines are designed to spin down gracefully, so this isn't like, oh my goodness, they're going to go out of control and explode and so forth, but definitely concerning from a long-term management perspective, considering these needed to be manually reset and recovered by the operators to go out into the field to reconnect these assets. So the Intercon incident reported across both Reuters and Handelsblatt uh, in Germany, covering both the scope of this incident, again, 6,000 turbines for 10 gigawatts of generating capacity, and uh, really showing the brittle nature of uh, con con uh, connectivity for distributed electricity assets like renewable generation, distributed electric uh, resources and similar. Uh, again, something you could look into in greater detail in the paper. But you know, no indications that this was intentional by Russia. Uh, it certainly would seem very silly and very escalatory for them to deliberately target wind generation capacity outside of the conflict zone as part of this event, but definitely shows a dual use capacity for this sort of in communication infrastructure, the KASAT network, and what removal of that infrastructure means when it comes to the ability to safely and consistently operate things like distributed energy resources across wide areas. So, okay, we've covered the KASAT incident. Now let's dig in a little bit further into the actual phases and operations. So ultimately, we see two events and one victim, wiper malware and DDoS activity, both resulting in KASAT network impacts. Okay, what do these look like specifically? So first for the wiper malware, Acid Rain, uh, this was identified within a few weeks of the uh, events in late February by researchers at Sentinel-1 who spotted this malware in the wild and were able to reverse it and 
conclude you know, pretty effectively that, well, based upon functionality, strings, and timing, that this appears to be linked with the KA set outage, which was then confirmed by representatives from Biaset and the KA set operator shortly thereafter, who also followed up with their own blog post uh, approximately hours, uh, within hours of the Sentinel-1 post going live as well. Um, what's interesting, though, is that we didn't know how this was deployed until about a year later, again, when uh, representatives from Biaset presented additional information at the Black Hat and DEF CON conferences last year. And it was interesting because we saw that this event started with access to a VPN concentrator at the KASAT network operator, uh, specifically their NOC in Turin, Italy, that then allowed them to migrate to a management server within that network, and then further migrate to network operation servers that allowed them to enumerate the nodes connected to the network, and then push an acid rain payload for staging to an FTP server that allowed for further distribution on to KASAT modems. So in looking at acid rain's functionality, um, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the uh, assessment that I received from the public reporting is that it was a MIPS ELF binary targeting customer equipment, not terribly sophisticated, if we want to use a very weaselish words like sophisticated for this uh, in nature, but certainly effective in that it would overwrite, overwrite and delete storage devices, uh, device files, and then reboot the system. So there were indications that this might have been maybe a little bit of a rush in order to meet a deadline, but certainly effective in targeting specifically the uh, surf beam devices that were being used in the KA set network in order to facilitate communications. It's interesting to note, and we won't get into too much detail here other than noting its link for attribution purposes, but this code base appears to have been under continued development as Sentinel-1 was able to identify a newer variant named Acid Poor uh, approximately a year later that it indicates much broader targeting and greater functionality uh, hasn't been definitively identified in in the wild activity although there are assessments that it might have been linked to some communication disruptions in Ukraine but it is interesting to note that at least the idea behind acid rain remains very much active or at least was uh, for some time later again further details links to both the Sentinel one research and in the paper if you want further detail but wait, there is more. So certainly there was a malware component to this, and it's interesting that if we look at how we derive artifacts for investigative purposes, that malware certainly leaves behind things that we can investigate that get pushed to repositories like commercial malware repositories from which we can extract items for further research and analysis. But what was interesting is that the other element of this attack took place in a way that doesn't leave behind uh, artifacts that engender third-party research and analysis. And if you don't know what you're looking for and are keeping logs effectively, may be very difficult to pull apart, uh, especially after the fact. Because before, during, and after, uh, for approximately two weeks after the acid rain deployment, the KASAT network was targeted with a fairly unique DHCP-based DDoS attack as well. So I've already talked about this at a high level. Let's look at this in a little bit of detail. So effectively, this starts with customer equipment that's already authenticated to the KASAT network, subverting legitimate nodes that are part of this communication system, and then initiating a DHCP request crafted in such a fashion that it will respond in a negative acknowledgement message to be issued by the DHCP server that then propagates back to the terminal connecting to that customer equipment in order to knock that off of the KASAT network. So leveraging a way of manipulating DHCP in order to selectively remove devices from uh, the network by essentially uh, removing the DHCP lease so it can no longer effectively communicate as part of that system. Not, you know, on the one hand, like, well, that seems kind of simple, uh, but also it seems kind of subtle and interesting because uh, in talking with the operators of the network, this seemed to be not just very concerning, but also continued quite effectively for, or like I said before, over two weeks or approximately two weeks after the initial events on the 22nd and 23rd of February. Again, selectively knocking off terminals based upon how customer equipment was submitting DHCP requests to the environment. So. Kind of interesting stuff, not something that we typically see, and uh, maybe not even most effectively labeled as DDoS activity, like we normally associate DDoS with volumetric attacks in order to overwhelm nodes. In this case, using a distributed uh, communication in the sense of using multiple compromised or subverted user nodes within the uh, KA set network to send effectively a denial of service packet into the environment in order to start removing assets from the system. Furthermore, this activity evolved with defender mitigations. Uh, talking to personnel from Biasat, they found it very interesting 
you know, in an academic sense, very frustrating in an operational sense, that uh, the attackers kept this up beyond the initial time window in order to continue this attack and to continue uh, degrading the effectiveness and operating capability of the KSAT network for Ukrainian military and command and control operations. This extended for a longer period of time and at least according to Viaset was both targeted and more impactful than the initial um, acid rain deployment. Don't have a way to independently verify that, unfortunately, uh, but at least that's their story and they're sticking to it. And as said earlier, this is something that from a Ukrainian perspective was perceived as being uh, effective in degrading communications at a very significant and very troubling time for the operational capacity and operational resiliency of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces. So in looking at this, we see two very different attacks in terms of perspective and in terms of how they're approaching the target. So in the case of Acid Rain, we see an attack that emerged from inside the network that then pushes out to nodes attached to it, compromising the network operator's uh, environment in order to then deliver a payload, stage that payload, and push it out to end user terminals. The other side of this was, from the DDoS activity perspective, was using compromised customer nodes in order to then undermine network infrastructure. So we have an inside out and outside in perspectives uh, that were taking place in order to facilitate or to uh, achieve this intrusion. And the result is degraded communications in either fashion. Through the you know, one uh, successful push to deliver the wiper payload to end user terminals, and then a more sustained push using network degradation in order to undermine the network over a period of time uh, by leveraging compromised or, well, potentially compromised, or we're not quite sure how the threat actor in question behind the DDoS activity uh, managed to execute this activity because these are assets that are outside of our logging and analysis window or sphere. So a, a bit of mystery behind precisely how this was executed and what sort of capability allowed for the threat actor to coordinate and execute this sort of activity from a variety of nodes connected to and authenticated to the KSAT network. So what do we learn from this? Well, first, we have an example potentially of a sort of combined cyber operational capability. Um, how effective was this? Debatable. Again, the Ukrainians are saying that this certainly had a impact. We don't know quite how much of an impact. And from the intercom perspective, we can see the latent possibilities that emerge in a attacking communication networks in this fashion. But the timing and sequencing indicates some degree of planning, at least, to coincide with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, it does not seem coincidental that within an hour of uh, Vladimir Putin announcing the special military operation, that these effects started to ramp up uh, both in terms of the acid rain deployment and an increase in the DDoS activity that was targeting Viasat or KASAT nodes. So the public comments from Ukrainian officials suggest notable impacts, but the effects were not contained to Ukraine. So that's problematic from a you know, specificity standpoint and potentially escalation standpoint, although there's no sign that anyone retaliated for the sake of Enercon. And it does not appear that the effects were widespread enough to materially impact events. So as we know, while the war is still ongoing in its current phase, uh, Russia's initial objectives in a decapitation strike against uh, Ukrainian leadership in Kiev and being able to overrun Ukrainian defenses didn't work, thankfully, for a variety of reasons. Um, and it appears that Ukrainian defense was able to organize and ensure continued uh, viable operations throughout the phases of this activity. But there are also thorny questions of attribution. So for one, the wiper malware, while there were initial links to Sandworm based upon some functionality that overlapped with another payload called, or another malware family called VPN filter, as far as the destructive component uh, embedded within it, subsequent reporting, uh, especially aligned with the acid pour variant that emerged later, indicated, uh, well, strongly indicated because uh, a couple of government ent entities explicitly linked acid pour to Sandworm, APT44, to take them for what you will. Um, and based upon the very tight code similarity between acid pour and acid rain, we could then you know, make a fairly firm conclusion that the wiper effect aligns with sad sandworm both in terms of responsibility uh, as allocated by entities that would have the information to make such a, uh, a statement, as well as aligning with known sandworm tradecraft and operations. This group has very much been involved in wiper activity historically, as well as destructive attacks targeting critical infrastructure functionality. So pretty close alignment there, not too much in the way that, uh, I mean, we could certainly question this, and we probably should to a certain extent, but the link here seems to be pretty solid. 
The DDoS activity, however, is a little different. Um, and it doesn't help that this activity has not been very thoroughly explored beyond, again, a couple of conference talks and some uh, written notification in previous Viasat uh, publications on this that didn't go into too much technical detail. This activity has never been attributed to any specific threat actor or entity. So it's an open question. Was this entirely separate from acid rain, or was this done in concert with this activity? Again, going back a couple of slides here, we see two very different perspectives on how to undermine the KESAT network. Um, could this have been coordinated? Certainly, um, it very well could have been coordinated. Knowing some of the interesting elements of, because uh, while we haven't linked the DDoS activity to any specific threat actor, I think we could all agree based upon targeting and timing that it is almost certainly Russian in origin. Um, the lack of cooperation and coordination among Ru Russian cyber threat groups, whether aligning with military intelligence, uh, domestic intelligence, as well as the intelligence services, can at times be less than ideal. And so it is an open question, were these items done in coordination or were these uncoordinated actions from separate entities within Russian intelligence agencies and Russian uh, military elements that just so happen to coincide with the beginning of operations? Uh, while there are DDoS attacks, and we could look to things like APT-28's uh, attacks on Unify devices, Sandworm's activity through Psychops Link and VPN filter against networking appliances, as well as the building of botnets and so forth that we saw with the Vulkan files with ScanV, uh, certainly a capability in terms of targeting end user nodes as part of the attempt to subvert Lejeune communications and potentially then deploy a capability that could be used to launch this sort of DDoS activity. But we don't have the evidence in order to really drive this conversation. So a lot of things that we can think about, a lot of things that we can maybe make some guesses on, but very little that would allow us to make an evidence-based conclusion as far as who is responsible for this. We also have interesting observations when it comes to renewable and distributed energy resources. So you can make the claim that we should be shocked that electric generation could be so easily disrupted by cyber. Or should we be? Because as we've seen an evolution in critical infrastructure operations, whether we're talking about distributed energy resources or assets like pipelines, remote mining sites, and similar, that we see an increasingly extended attack surface. You're not running fiber, uh, digging trenches or whatever, and running uh, hardwire communications to hundreds of wind turbines or whatever. You might to one single control center that then wirelessly connects to a bunch of others, but doing this to each individual site is a little difficult and expensive. So what we've seen, and this is not necessarily a new trend, just a very accelerated trend, is the reliance of over-the-air communications, whether we're talking about 5G modems, uh, wireless connectivity of various sorts, or the use of satellite communications ranging from things like KASAT to Starlink in order to connect assets like wind farms, uh, distributed storage, um, battery storage and similar, as well as solar assets when we're talking specifically about the energy space. The interesting thing about this is that as a result, we introduce a number of interesting touch points for adversaries to interact with this environment. Uh, we've seen a lot of focus on sort of up here at the satellite relay and things like electronic warfare, electronic attack against things like the over-the-air links. But we also open ourselves up to interesting ways of either leveraging the actual customer sites and entities that are uh, authenticated to this environment, or as we saw with the acid rain deployment on the provider side, that through a fairly traditional cyber component, uh, being able to influence these environments and have non-trivial impacts on their functionality. Now, in looking at this, renewable energy and distributed energy resources are increasingly remote or dispersed. It's part of the green energy revolution, and this is a good thing. Like, we should anticipate that this will continue. Um, this has re required an extension of communication pathways from very traditional and potentially hardened and difficult to access uh, links to include various over-the-air links that provide opportunities for attackers to either access nodes, uh, like we saw in the case of the DDoS activity, or to disrupt those links as shown in either the DDoS activity or the acid rain attack. So interesting attack scenarios that don't require a bit of knowledge as far as how electric utility operations function to disrupt the ability of those functions to maintain consistent command and control or consistent uh, operator control over the functioning of those assets uh, and to, if sustained over a period of time, to really inhibit the functionality and re reliability of those assets over a period of time. All right, implications and our path forward. What does this look like? 
Well, what it means from a broader perspective is that we're all living in a networked world. You know, we talk about things like, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure environments, that these things should be air-gapped or they should be segmented heavily from the rest of a variety of other civilian sort of uh, communication networks. But as we saw in the case of KASAT, this is being used not just for uh, the operation of those Enercon terminals, as well as other critical infrastructure that thankfully was not impacted, but also for strategic command and control and communication on the part of the Ukrainian government. We're seeing, for reasons of commercial efficiency and just cost, the overlapping of critical communications with commodity communication structures. Um, you're not running, you know, creating a whole separate internet in order for these things to work. So we're seeing a um, convergence across the same infrastructure that provides opportunities for adversaries to both disrupt that infrastructure because of its accessibility, as well as risks for third parties or non-aligned entities that are happening to use the same infrastructure as others for them to be inadvertently disrupted as part of a military operation like seen in the Enercon example. So we see as a result of this that the adoption of modern or at least emerging communication systems like our, uh, you know, distributed satellite communication systems such as a KASAT, Starlink, et cetera, provides opportunities for adversaries to impact nodes, links, and control centers for potentially disruptive or destructive effects. This is results in increasing risks that new communication technologies are certainly increasing our efficiency, potential bandwidth as we've seen with technologies like Starlink and Reach, but the security and reliability of these systems in the face of a dedicated attacker is questionable. Um, we haven't necessarily designed these systems in such a way to be as resilient as perhaps we need to, them to be. This shift, to, especially for SATCOM, for military and critical infrastructure, thus brings both benefits as well as risks that we need to be mindful of. So in orienting defense, we have to rely that defense relies not just on hardening and protecting the systems themselves, but as seen in the Enercon example, as well as for any other entities that are operating in these increasingly contested environments, the need for reliability and failover communication mechanisms. The goal here is not just producing secure systems, but producing resilient systems. If there's a big takeaway that we can uh, extract from this incident, both from the Ukrainian military perspective as well as from the Enercon wind generation perspective, is that single points of failure are not just you know, not ideal, but also untenable for critical uh, sorts of operations or functionality. So whether it is coming up with backup communications for, to ensure the resiliency of distributed electric or energy uh, generation or for military and strategic command and control that uh, just thinking that, okay, satellite constellations have sufficient failover involved that if one link goes down, we can migrate to another, kind of goes out the window given the nature of attacks like that was what was observed in 2022, where we can fundamentally alter the functionality of the overall, overall system, either from the uh, operator's own uh, internal network perspective, like we saw with acid rain deployment, or by subverting nodes connected to that system and then taking out uh, selective nodes through ne uh, interesting network manipulation or network traffic manipulation. Uh, either way, really casting in doubt our ability to use these as one-stop uh, resilient communication systems in and of themselves. So we have some time for questions. Uh, I will fast forward past this. So uh, some resources, I think these slides are posted at, at, on the extranet right now, but certainly consult the paper because this only scratched the surface for a lot of the elements of this incident, which I think is fairly interesting and has a lot of nuance that has not really been explored in depth before. Uh, but also feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions as well beyond this uh, venue or would like to get in touch with me otherwise. Okay.